Well, what a fantastic introduction to uh, day one of the science. Uh, excellent overview. And uh, now we're going to hear another equally amazing uh, set of stories from uh, Dr. Al Buick, uh, uh who is going to talk to us about uh, his uh, experiences with the Philadelphia and the Phoenix experiments. Uh, Dr. Al Buick was born in 1916 as Edward Cameron, son of Alexander Cameron, Sr. He was raised in Long Island. He attended Princeton University and later Harvard University, where he earned a Ph.D. degree in physics in 1939. This is an incredible story. A few months later, he and his brother Duncan joined the U.S. Navy, were quickly made officers, and were assigned to the ongoing project called Project In Invincibility at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. After the disastrous test, which we're going to hear about, of August 12, 1943, he remained in the Army until July 1947, when he was removed, brainwashed of all of his memory, and then given a new identity, Al Buick and a new family. He completed engineering school in 1958, got a BSEE degree, engaged in a career as a consultant engineer until 1988 when he retired. Dr. Buick is now researching the secret government projects, especially in regards to the Philadelphia Experiment and the Project Phoenix, which we're going to hear about today. He's lectured all over the country, and today, the title of his talk, specifically, is From Philadelphia to Phoenix, The Psychotronic Connection. I'd like to welcome Dr. Al Buick. Let's hear a round of applause. Thank you. Can everybody hear me all right? Good. The subject today is a little bit different than what I have normally done. Uh, last year, I gave you a fairly detailed history of the Philadelphia experiment and how it tied into the Phoenix project. Today, my intent is somewhat different. I wish to show the background connections between the two projects, how they happened, the politics that was involved, and the interlocking uh, controls, if you will, and the communication which resulted in the two tests locking to each other, how this really occurred and why, and what other problems were developed because of this. It's a rather involved story, but I only have 45 minutes, so I will, again, try to keep this rather brief. As you know, the Philadelphia experiment culminated in two tests for the Eldridge, or if you don't know it, I'll state it now. The original 22 July 1943 test for the Eldridge, which was bad enough in terms of the personnel problem, but did not lock up to the Phoenix Project. And the final test, 12 August 1943, in which the ship went into hyperspace, and it was a total disaster when it came back. And the nature of that disaster actually was far greater than anyone realizes, and the potential was unbelievably bad. And I wish to go into that and what happened and how it was averted. The Phoenix Project actually has been covered very well by Preston Nichols, and he will be going into some of that today and some resurrection of the technology and how it worked. That's why we're not going into that at all. I really don't understand what happened in terms of the politics and what led up to it. We have to go back to the beginning. The project started, as I have previously stated, University of Chicago, 1931, with Dr. John Hutchinson, Nikola Tesla, and the staff as this Dr. Emil Kirtenauer. The important point here in the history we have to follow is what happened in terms of Tesla. By 1934, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president of the United States. 33 is elected, and he became actual president in March of 34. In those days, it was March 20th. They've changed the date to 20 January since. And when he was in office, he invited his old friend Nikola Tesla down to Washington, as they have known each other since 1917, exchanging amenities and uh, 
President Roosevelt asking Tesla, well, what have you been up to? What have you been doing? And, of course, the President already knew about the ongoing work on Project Invisibility, but there were other things Tesla had been into which were exchanged. And among other things, Tesla mentioned the fact that he had been in communication with extraterrestrials. Now, this very much intrigued the President, who, unknown to the general public, was very much interested in metaphysics and rather abstruse matters. He was very curious about this, and uh, Tesla, Tesla told him a little bit about it. The equipment had been developed for such communication by RCA, which Tesla had been a member and staff member since 1919. In 1935, he became vice president and director of engineering and research worldwide, a post he held in 19, until 1939 when he retired from RCA. In that period of time, he developed some super sensitive receivers, basically designed for RCA's use in overseas communication, and also a few transmitters here and there, all of which came in usefully to Tesla in his ongoing quest for knowledge. So he told FDR he had been in communication with several groups. Roosevelt was curious, can I talk with them? And uh, Tesla said, definitely, now I can arrange it if you wish, and he did. After which Roosevelt decided he would like to meet some of these people. And they asked Tesla, is this possible? And he says, I believe it is. He said, there's two groups principally you might be interested in talking with. He says, if you have in mind making any kind of a deal, because at that time, as everyone knows, we were in the midst of a terrible depression, and Roosevelt was looking for some means to get out of it, to end it. In those days, he was perhaps a little bit more altruistic than, altruistic than might have been the case later. So arrangements were made to meet two groups, first the Pleiadians, and then later, a K group, as I call them, the Kondrashkin. He met first for the Pleiadians. They gave a pitch as to what they might be able to do to help. He says, fine, but I want to talk with the other group first before I make a decision. So we talked with the second group and decided in favor of the second group. And the Pleiadians at that point bowed out. And as a matter of fact, went over to Nazi Germany and made a deal with Hitler which I'm not get into because that's another long story, but it does figure in the background precedent to World War II and the development of German technology. So Roosevelt accepted their offer of help, in which they said they would provide some new industries and other things. 1938, an offer was made to set up the entire new industry called atomic energy, which, of course, we have today. The Ro President Roosevelt was very... Uh, interested and very receptive to the idea. And he consulted with his various advisors and the military, and the military says, whoa, if you let aliens set up an industry like this, even though it's on our home turf, and they are in essence controlling it and know where it can go, what happens? We do not have true control over it. What's going to happen in the future? Will we become vassals or slaves to them? The military advised against it, and Roosevelt turned his mind against it and so advised them, and they became upset and says, well, there's nothing else we can do for you, and disappeared into the woodwork. Well, in those days, of course, we did have intelligence apparatus, but it was not anyway as near as efficient as today, and they did not have all of, have all of the niceties of spying, which we have now. So by 1940, Roosevelt was becoming very concerned where have these characters gone? What are they doing? They were quite literally vanished as far as we could determine, or I should say the president and the staff could determine. He says, what are we going to do about this? Well, somebody came up with a bright idea. Mr. President, why don't we go out and find some of those psychics that are running around here and see if we can find some really good ones and maybe they can tell us where they are and what they're doing. The president said, fine. Harry Bennett who was then the president's right-hand advisor, was appointed the task of finding some good psychics and setting up a secret organization. He did. That organization, founded in 1940, later became known as the Psychor. Very important for many reasons. It has been, until recently, the backbone and mainstay of some very high-level spying operations and uh, intelligence on which many agencies have depended. Now, that organization in its infancy in 1940 was set up by hired psychics who could prove they had their stuff and together and knew what they were doing and could prove it. 
and they were given new identities and put in a secret warehouse in Arlington, Virginia, at least initially, and went about their tasks. Whether or not they were found or any missing key people, I don't know. But that organization expanded. It was set up to be a permanent organization, and of course Harry Bennett had to look for a man to head it up and organize it, train the people, and set up a total program. They found such a man late 1940. He was hired in 1941, and he set up the training programs. And uh, from that point on, they were looking basically for pairs, identical paired twins, which were ideal for the type of training they were doing, mostly male, some female pairs. And if they couldn't find them as time went on, they did use computers to computer match, but this came much later. Eventually, the CIA was formed. They took over the organization. And that was in 1947. About 1950, NSA came into being, and they inherited the Psych Corps, and it's been under control of NSA ever since. So what did they really do, and what function did they serve? As time went on, and they expanded, and they did expand into about 50 operating pairs at their peak, perfect spies. They could penetrate virtually anything on this planet. And of course, after World War II was over, they were very interested in what they could do in terms of spying on Russia. And then, perhaps unbeknownst to us at first, the Russians also set up their own group, and there were several groups set up in other countries. But I'm only concerned with what happened here. The man who was chosen to head this organization up and actually remained as director until he retired in 1984 there's a gentleman by the name of Emil P. de Costain. Perhaps some of you have heard the name. I know a few people have, but very few, because he was very much undercover. He was born in 1900. A very unusual thing I found out about him, which hardly anybody knew about until after he'd retired. He was himself a walk-in. I guess who? The K Group. So if you want to do some spying on the organization that's spying on you, take over the directorship, and they did. Important for a reason because of what it led into in terms of the two experiments. The Philadelphia experiment, as I previously stated, locked up with the Phoenix Project, and it could only lock up on a very critical date. And that critical date was the 12th of August, 1943, and the 12th of August, 1983. Theoretically, it could have locked up in 1963, but there was no ongoing experiment at that time, such as the Phoenix Project, which was required. Dr. John Van Neumann was, of course, the second and final director of the Philadelphia Experiment. He was also the first director of the Phoenix Project when it came, when it came online after the war, and it went through several phases. But the important phase of the Phoenix Project was from 1975 through 1983 when they developed the t capability of time travel and the time tunnels, as Dr. Carl Sagan liked to call them, the wormholes in space. Wormholes in space on time, they had the capability and it was fully functional. Someone had to know, in order to get these two experiments on either end to lock up, that there were critical dates in which it would work, and the rest of the years in between it would not work. And someone had to communicate this information to both ends. And this is the thrust of my discussion, and what happened, and why this whole thing locked up, and what some of the mechanics of, and technology of time is all about. I have a few slides I will add and put in here a little bit later, but I want to get into some more of this material first. The director of the Psy Corps himself was obviously a psychic. And he went on through the period of time, and because he was a member, in essence, of the K Group, and most of your aliens have the capability of time travel, they knew what was going on at both ends. I've stated in the other prior lecture, and I'll have to state it again. Prior lecture, and I'll have to state it again. The real purpose of the two projects, quite aside from the uh, patent scientific advancement, which was desired by our scientists here in the United States and on Earth, was the purpose of locking these two projects up for a very specific reason. The very specific reason was 
to provide a rift in space-time 40 years wide and hold it there long enough to let some very large spaceships through from another t time frame dimension. Now, in 1947 onward, the K group was pretty much lost. In 1954, there was another group which came into uh, purview of the governments, and that was, of course, the Greys. There was a series of UFO crashes in New Mexico in 1947, 48, and 49. I won't go into them in detail. But because of that, the government sent a call out through the vast array of radio telescopes in New Mexico, a call for help into outer space. We have an alien here. We don't know what to do with him. He's ill. Uh, how do you take care of him, et cetera, et cetera? Is there anybody out there that knows who he is and what you do with him? The government got an answer. It took a while, but they got an answer. A group of small ships showed up in about 1953 with some greys on them, and then there was an exchange of uh, ideas and thoughts, and some hostages went both ways. With the promise of return in 1954, which the greys did do in very large numbers, landed at either Edwards or Holloman Air Force Base, or both. Eisenhower disappeared out of Palm Springs in one of his golfing weekends to Edwards, met with the aliens, and signed an agreement, a non-interference agreement, in which we agreed not to interfere with each other's civilizations and there would be an exchange of technology. Well, the non-interference agreement didn't last very long because it became very obvious to our government that the Greys weren't keeping it and what exchange of technology took place was not perhaps all that was expected. The important point was that our government agreed to provide bases for them underground, some 75, full underground railroad system. Construction started in 1959. But the Greys came in very large numbers. We don't know how many. The government perhaps does. It's estimated now they're probably in excess of one million. And a very large ship that came in wanted to orbit around Earth, and they provided shuttles down to the surface of the Earth. They could not have gotten through without that rift in space-time. They were here. Other groups were here. There was a group from Orion. They actually were in charge of, in many respects, not formally, but in charge of the scientific development of the Phoenix Project. Therefore, they knew what it was capable of. They helped set up the science and the technology. And they also knew of the critical dates. The dates of 12 August is actually the function of the Earth's biorhythms. The Earth has a series of biorhythms, four of them, which, like the human biorhythms, do peak out once every so often. Nobody in our scientific community knew anything about this. It turns out, from what I've learned, that the ancients knew about it. The, uh, let us say, the recluse lamas in Tibet and elsewhere knew about it. They do have a great deal of knowledge. And they knew that the Mother Earth is actually a living entity, unlike the rock science, which is taught to us in the colleges, and has a sort of consciousness, perhaps nothing we can understand. But nonetheless, as a living entity, has its own biorhythms. And those biorhythms, four of them, peak out once every 20 years. A window approximately a day wide usually falls on the 12th of August, plus or minus a day, because our Gregorian calendar is not all that accurate. It misses 0.24 days per year, and once every century, you have to add a year to correct the calendar. Nonetheless, that was known to these aliens. Now, Emil Castine was in the middle of this, and he had to provide a connecting link, and as did also the aliens. Where we were in 1943 with that test, we had no knowledge of any kind why that date which was handed to us for the second test the 12th of August, which was given to us as a drop-dead test, which came from above the office, uh, the top office personnel, namely the chief of naval department. We knew the order came from beyond him, but at that time we had no idea where from. It came out of the little White House. There was two gentlemen in there who uh, more or less had uh, the knowledge and the communications. Harry Bennett provided the authority and Dr. Costain provided the connection, and the drop-dead date was handed down on the authority of the White House to the Chief of Naval Operations that it must be conducted by the, or on the 12th of August. 
But the problems we had, the Navy knew, and those people knew, that uh, Dr. von Neumann was going to delay as long as possible on the final test to get as much time as possible. The chart worked around the clock trying to correct the problem because he knew he had a serious problem. And they could not correct it. In any case, they waited until the 12th of August, which was the desired slot. On the other end, we had the Phoenix Project. Now, what is the history, very, very briefly, of the Phoenix Project? Its hardware became functional about 1975 in the earliest phases. Preston Nichols has gone into this heavily in the past. In the past. And by 77, it was operational. By 79, all the changes had been made. And it was signed off as a functioning entity, a fully operational project in 1980, and it was functioning from that point until it crashed on the night of 12 August 1983, sabotaged. That, however, is not germane to this part of the story. On the 1st of August of 1983, something very unusual happened. Prior to that time, the operation of the station, the Montauk operation, Project Phoenix, had been on an intermittent basis, several hours a day, maybe eight hours a day, once every two or three days, whatever they had going in the way of a project where they wanted to utilize the equipment, they used it. But it was never used on a continuous basis, day after day. On the 1st of August, an order came down through the channels that the station would be turned on and left operational continuously until further notice. That meant around the clock. And it was. Now, what did this mean? I'm going to first show you a few slides, and then going to get into a little bit of, shall we say, whiteboard operation to show some of the aspects that are involved in terms of the time. I've shown these slides before, but perhaps it's a good reminder. The Philadelphia experiment took place in outside shown these slides before, but perhaps it's a good reminder. The Philadelphia experiment took place in outside of the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Where is the pointer? Ah, there it is. Right opposite a little town, in the middle of better focus, entitled called Red Bank, is where the Philadelphia Navy Yard is still, though it may not be after this year is over. They are threatening to close it. The average was docked here when they ran the test. They went down the river here a distance, quite a distance to where the bay was at least two miles wide. It was about a mile on this point. They went further down the line here. This is, of course, a picture of the famous Eldridge file shot. I will not go into the equipment other than to say the main body of equipment was in this little cubicle. That was the door where we went in and out. In the test, there was a special antenna mast on top here, designed by T. Townsend Brown, a special omnidirectional phased array to handle the output from four transmitters. And this was the ship for the final test that was used in the Philadelphia Harbor, further down, of course, away from Philadelphia. The Phoenix Project took place on the extreme end of Long Island, way out here on the tip. And there was a park there. There was a town of Montauk a little further in. There was a state park out there and also a military base. It does not show in this photo, actually map it by AAA because this is the most recent one. Earlier ones show the military base inactive. Fort Hero in the extreme end had been there since 1916, perhaps, prior to World War I, and was abandoned in 1986 after all the tests were over. But that was where the other end of the terminal, shall we say, of the two experiments took place, out here. And that was the Phoenix Project, the prime home. At one time, there were 25 operating ones. And that was the one that caused the lockup, the one that was primarily concerned. In case you haven't seen any of the photos, I'll only show two. The main radar tower from the SAGE system, which was adapted and changed to the Phoenix Project. There's this, and that's what you see driving east from Montauk. It's a huge building and a tower 
with the antenna on top, which is 60 feet high and 120 feet across and weighs approximately 125 tons. And close up, if you get on the base, which is open, and you can wander out there if you want to, but do it during the day. This is the tower, eight feet, approximately eight stories high, and with the antenna, the total height is about 150 feet, and we estimate. Now I'm gonna leave this slide on because what we were dealing with, very briefly again, in the structure of our universe as we know it, is a five-dimensional universe, five-dimensional nature, other than it is on the blackboard. And time is a, of itself, as I think this slide is familiar to Bob Yedlick, is in the form of a huge torus and is a structure, this is a mathematical representation, of course, you have a central flow of time through the center, a more or less linear flow, which we call the time we measure, the fourth dimension. And of course, you have this helical coil on the outside, which actually establishes the time rate flow. And this is called T2 and is actually the fifth dimension. Now, what I need to get into here a little bit is what really goes on. is somewhat uh, poorly done, but I'm not a great artist. We'll call this one, two, three, uh, three dimensions of physical reality as we know them. <laughs> and according to theory, Einstein et al., time at the right angle, we'll call a fourth dimension, is at a right angle theoretically. These three physical dimensions flow and exist in time. If there was no time, our reality, our physical reality would not exist. So it's supposedly these are at right angles. It flow according to a rate which you can describe in the torus of time. But there's another important aspect, and this is the very important one. We actually have a fifth dimension, we'll call it T2, which is the fifth. And it is, if you look at it on end from the torus, take a cross section, this is a neat little thing which is really another vector on the end of the fourth dimension, which is the fifth. And this thing is describing, in essence, a circle. And as it corkscrews ahead, we call it forward time by mere reference. We don't know whether we're going forward or we're going backwards. It depends upon which universe you're looking at. But it creates a fourth dimensional vector in the center, which is a more or less even flow, theoretically very even. We'll not go into other problems which could change that rate in terms, in terms of the universe. This was what we were playing with in the project, and actually this is what they were playing with in both projects. It is time and its essence. Now the average had a field created around it, the purpose of which was, again using the pointer and looking at this, the purpose of which, when the confined field of the average, was to change the helical rate. If you change the helical rate, you change the time flow, but you don't want to speed it up to the point where the ship disappears. What you want to do is something rather exotic. I'm saying what you want to do because what they wanted to do and what they did do are two different things. Speaking in terms of the looking on the end of this, let's say this torus, our reality here, we we'll call it reality one. You have a free a second reality at 90 degrees, a third and a fourth, and you can even have a fifth. The second order reality is at 90 degrees. But you don't want to take the overs that far in terms of the time element. You're rotating it around the torus, and what you do you start pulling it around by speeding up the corkscrew. Then you at that point by going back to the normal rate so that at 60 degrees approximately, the average is optically invisible and radar invisible. If you stop a little before that, which is what they did in the final test, let's say perhaps 45 degrees, it's radar invisible but not optically invisible, almost 
but not quite. So you rotate it and you hold it in terms of what is within the field. What's outside, theoretically, you don't worry about. Well, that was the theory, and of course the aspect of this is very interesting, namely the Aldrich and the generators were creating a sixth order field so that they could manipulate the fifth order field, which was P2, or the second order time. And we have five orders of, uh, five dimensions, if you will, five orders, however you want to express it, in our reality. And again, going back to what Bob said the other night, which is very neat, you have a sixth dimensional order, which is an isolation between the next five, which is the reverse universe, actually the contra of matter, and if you go beyond the 11th, as Van Neumann knew, you then are in hyperspace and the 12th order. To get this project to work in terms of shoving the Eldridge into hyperspace and creating the bubble and creating the entire rift in time required a 12th order function. Now, the Eldridge was capable of a 6th order function, which would not do it. And I remember some of the discussions of Von Neumann after it was all over, and as he would say, uh, this was in later years. Well, the Eldridge had a sixth order capability. The project here at Phoenix had an eighth order capability. Where did the other four orders come from? They came from a very interesting function. The Phoenix project normally could only produce an eighth order function, but it had the capability in terms of its memory systems and the actual uh, network the lattice of the LC networks, which are the energy storage networks, and the way they were designed, they could store etheric orders of energy. Because it was a 25th order network, could store up to 25 orders of, of energy, up to the 25th. By turning the system on, and the station on, on the 1st of August, and leaving it on continuously, approximately every 24 hours, because they went through the entire torus of time, through plus and minus infinity, they added one order of reality. After five days, they were the 12th order. And by the 12th of August, they were well beyond because they left the station on continuously and, of course, hoping there were no breakdowns, which there were not at that point, thanks to Preston Nichols and his engineering. Uh, it kept running. Now, the other aspect which was unknown to us was, of course, the biorhythm problem. Let us go over to another page. The race biorhythms are only draw in terms of how they peak out. They produce literally a spike. 12 August. 12 August. 12 August. 20-year intervals of concern to us, and also 2003. Here sat the Eldridge until it moved, and here sat the Phoenix Project. It did not move. It was rather well anchored. And in the middle of 63, there's essentially nothing. There's another peculiar thing that happens. As you start this business of going through time, let's mark this as 43, let's mark this as 63, and let's mark this as 83. looking at it and sidewise again you are actually a full circle for the 40 years and it takes 40 years ago the full circle of 20 years where you have a synchronization point you're 180 out of phase which can be represented as a sine wave like so with a crossover point in 63 but this uh, this is a flat representation this doesn't mean it's reversing polarity per se but it does problem was created, and the problem was created is this. Time also has waves. 
like a standing wave in electromagnetic theory on an RF transmission line, if you don't damp it properly and its characteristic impedance, let us show theoretically a nice little line where we have RF on it, properly terminated, it's even of constant voltage, and as we say, the standing wave ratio is one. That means you have perfect transmission and there are no waves coming back at you. If this thing is not properly terminated out here in the characteristic impedance of the source and the transmission line, whatever you're using, you start to get funny little things. These things start to build up, build up, and you start to come down here to a lower level, and these start to build up, and you start to come to a lower level. You build up standing waves, and these things go up, and they come back. And when it gets bad enough, you have enormous voltage levels and theoretically, they can go unterminated out at this end. Theoretically, they can go to infinity. They don't, for practical reasons. But you get the same problem in time. Got it. And this means something very um, extraordinary. If you have standing waves in time, you will find that this time factor starts doing this. The standing waves produce a phenomena of standing waves which go back and forth, and if you start whipping through the 63 point, the crossover point, and create a reverse time wave, you then have in the reality in which you're dealing the artificial reality as well as coupled to both ends, and most particularly in the 83 end where the Phoenix Project is, you can generate and they were in the process of generating a reverse time wave. What happens if you have a forward and reverse time wave hitting the physical Earth at the same time? As I found out very recently, Dr. Van Neumann knew what the problem was and knew what could result. And they had to set up a special team prior to the critical date of 12 August 83 to handle the problem. Had they not found the correct team of scientists, there were four involved, Dr. Van Neumann, a second man whom I know but I will not give the name of because he doesn't want to give him, and two scientists from the future, yes I did say the future, because with Montauk they could go into the future or the past. They got a team together, they moved hardware to 1963 to provide damping because they knew that if this thing they got a team together, they moved hardware to 1963 to provide damping because they knew that if this thing was not damped sufficiently, at least to a critical level, to prevent the reverse time wave from hitting, do you have any idea what would have happened? They would have torn the entire tectonic plate structure of the North American continent apart, ripped off the entire top level of the North American continent, probably to the Rocky Mountains. To a depth of 500 to 700 feet, the ocean would have roared in, and we would have been back in the Stone Age instantly. That is what they faced, and that is what they had to prevent. And since I'm here talking to you today, they prevented it. Or they wouldn't be here, any of us. That was the problem they faced, and that is what they did correct. There was a code name for that project. The code name was Atlanticus Not Revisited. <laughs> Rather interesting uh, parallel. I'm sure some of you know the stories of Atlantis. They did successfully solve this, and of course the time rift was created without the additional problems. The aliens had what they wanted, including a stable Earth, because I'm quite sure they didn't want half of the planet ripped apart. Otherwise, what was their purpose in coming here? They wanted a viable planet with a society and civilization intact, which it still is. And that problem had to be solved and was solved. There are many aspects of this. I'm not going to even attempt to go into a math on this. Uh, in fact, I don't remember most of it. I think uh, Preston could if he wanted to explain it mathematically. But this problem was solved. <clears throat> the whole thing was damped down, and these people disbanded. This was not a government project, believe it or not. It was privately done. It was privately run and the people who were involved were non-governmental and I question if the government even knew what was going on perhaps when it was all over or perhaps till now that was solved and consequently it went on 
and the physical aspects of our reality remained intact. But here you had that problem. How did you get this whole thing to settle up and line up? And how did you get the communication? Without the extraterrestrials and without Dr. Costain, they wouldn't have been able to put the pieces together in that fashion because the test on the 20th or 22nd of July of 43 with the Eldridge produced no oddball effects other than the fact they had serious electromagnetic exposure problems to the crew. The ship didn't disappear and nothing happened to it. When it came back on the 12th of August, four hours later approximately, the ship had some physical damage and of course the people buried in the decks and the pokeheads, uh, they had a very, very serious problem they faced. That problem, in terms of the personnel, has been solved since. I do not know the exact technology in which they finally did solve it, but Van Neumann was requested in 1947 to go back and look at the problem and see if they could salvage anything. He did. He solved the problem. First, he had to invent a computer. The modern electronic computer is the brainchild of Dr. John Van Neumann. The Institute of Events studied. The first one built, perfected is perhaps not the word, but functional. In 1952, in a complete system involving a computer shipped to the Navy in 53 with another test on another ship. And I was not there because the Navy had decided it was time for me to disappear. And that test was very successful in 53, and they renamed the project, no longer Project Rainbow, but Project Phoenix. It was a big umbrella that covered many, many projects. Over many years, many generations of hardware, they did make it very practical. It is now on the B-1 and the B-2 bombers. It's on all the large carriers. The B-2 bomber, of course, being the stealth. And that system is totally functional without any apparent hazardous side effects. I was removed from the Navy in 1947. I knew too much, was learning too much from digging in the vaults of Los Alamos, and somebody with the communication up and down the line decided that I had to go. But part of this problem and the damping out here from 43 to 83, as a Levinson equation state, there are standing wave ripples which go on for another 20 years out to 2003. This part had to be damped. We weren't concerned about the back end. So Duncan and I were specially set up and processed by whom I do not know and how I don't know. But we've been the stabilizing factors on this whole Levinson uh, matrix, if you will, the time stability factor, which has kept everything stable. And after 2003, I guess we're not required anymore. Who knows what will happen to us by then. That was also part of the project uh, called Atlanticus Not Revisited. I do not know what was done, but I do know it was accomplished. I think we've fairly well covered this, and in a brief nutshell, the problems that were generated by those two projects were solved. Of course, Phoenix went down on the night of 12 August 83 from sabotage, and it's been out of operation ever since. Though there is a new Phoenix at a different location, now essentially operational. The aliens knew what they wanted, they got what they wanted, and today we have a problem with the aliens that will not go into. I think that pretty well winds it up, other than to say uh, my experiences have been put into a book entitled The Philadelphia Experiment and Other UFO Conspiracies. I do have a few copies upstairs on the table where Press Nichols is located, and I also have a few left, I believe, in the bookstore, and they are for sale. If you have any other questions, I think I have about two minutes. I'll attempt to answer any questions at this point, and then I can talk and answer questions later. Yeah, gentlemen, our lady back there with glasses. Oh. If they have this advanced technology, what do they need us for? They need us for two things. Fact three, perhaps, but number one, in terms of the technology, they need our capability to manufacture hardware to their specifications, which we are now capable of doing. And so far as the Orions are concerned, they're engaged in an advanced base operation in a general warfare. And there is warfare going on out in space now. We hope it doesn't come to the surface of Earth. The second part of this is, in terms of the greys, they need us as warm bodies for genetic experimentation to develop a new race 
and involving this is also the CIA and our government in secrets, very great secrecy. They are doing extreme genetic engineering and have developed a lot of new things, including a totally new class of implants, which are now biological, not hard chips. And this is only one tip of the iceberg. They need us for that. Yes, one other question? Uh, no, that's, that's it. Fine. Okay. Only 10 seconds left. All right. I thank you all for your attention, and if you have any other questions, I'll answer them later.